Jackie Wilson was born on June 9, 1934, in Detroit, Michigan. As a teenager growing up in Detroit, Jackie won the Golden Gloves at the age of 16. He wanted to become a professional prize fighter, but he was pressured from his mother to get into a more stable career. Jackie turned to singing. In 1953, Jackie Wilson joined a group called the Dominoes, replacing Clyde McFadder. Clyde McFadder went on to form a group called the Drifters. Now, in 1957, Jackie left the Dominoes to pursue his own career. Jackie met a man named Nat Tarnapol, who took on the job of managing Jackie, and a few months later, he got Jackie an exclusive contract with Brunswick Records, and the rest is history. You're about to hear an interview with Jackie and myself. Well, actually, I met Nat through the late Al Green, who was the manager of Laverne Baker at the time, and um, we were all from Detroit. Nat was a young, hot-headed kid that wanted to get ahead, and uh, he was doing all the publishing for Al Green. And, uh, well, I took, at least Al Green took me when I left the Domino's, and he started to manage me. And he got me a contract through Laverne Baker with Decca, which was for Brunswick. And then, um, oh, God rest his soul, he died. And then Nat decided he was going to try his hand. Although there were several other guys around, Nat just packed up one day and took me by the arm with his raincoat, and then we'll forget it, and we ran. <laughs> now, in 1957, this was a big year for you because that first hit record on Brunswick came about, Reet Petit. How did that happen? That happened to a young man that I don't know if you know very well, but uh, he's got a small label. I think it's called Slow Town. No, Motown. His name is Barry Gordy, Jr. <laughs> he was doing the writing for us then. Barry Gordy followed with another hit record right on the heels. That's why. How about right. that one? What, what can you remember about that song? I remember that, um, well, I liked it, but I was very hoarse that day in the, on the studio. I couldn't hardly talk because I had been working so hard, you know, with the other songs and on the road. And so I couldn't hit, as Nat would call it, bird. They used to say, hit the bird, man, hit the bird, which is the high note. Uh, now you had your first hit record, and uh, Jackie Wilson all of a sudden became a familiar name with disc jockeys around the country. But uh, I think it was the spring of 1958 when your first gold record came about, which was a ballad called To Be Loved. Uh, was correct. there a special story behind that one? Well, um, actually, that was Barry's idea, too, and also his pen, his penmanship. He decided I could sing better than I could gimmick. Uh, he wanted to prove I could do both. Well, you had a song that came out in around 1967 that to me was almost note for note the Jackie Wilson of the 50s. The song was Higher and Higher and it's one of my all-time favorites and because of the way it builds and everything else. But that was so close to what you were doing in the right. 50s. Uh, what what uh, was the reason that this song came about? Because they threw it away. They threw it in the garbage can. The song itself, because the guy that brought it in brought it in on a tape with a group singing and on a little tinky tinky guitar and no one could hear it but me I could actually hear the way that well I felt it, it was a church type thing and this took it and threw it away and I picked, picked it back up <laughs> I told him to try it one time in your career uh, you were a professional or prize fighter uh, what uh, was the reason that you left the ring to choose to go into a field of singing actually I didn't want to leave my mother just grabbed me by the hair one day and told me no more. Well, actually what happened, I had a good record, and I had won Golden Gloves in Michigan with a mustache, and I was only about 16, I was supposed to be 18, the whole bit, and I was just getting real good, and she walked into the, uh, she walked to the arena one night, and I was boxing, and I always looked for in a certain seat, and she wasn't there, and all of a sudden she walked in, and my nickname is Sonny. And she hollers out real loud, hey, Sonny. And I turn around and whop, <laughs> whop, whop. <laughs> so she finally saw me got knocked, I mean, beat to bits. <laughs> so she told me no more. <laughs> Is this where you kind of develop that <laughs> fancy footwork that you do on stage, that spinning around and that style of yours? Yes, the it ring? Is. I kind of watch you. You were so light on your feet, yes. just like you were prancing around in the ring. Uh, there's one area in, in your career, uh, it's, it's been a tragic one, but I'm sure you've probably, something good has come from it. But in 1961, uh, a near-fatal accident happened when one of your frenzied fans uh, approached you with a pistol and you got shot. I was shot in the stomach. And, um, well, I still have the bullet. I still carry it. It's in my back, but it's in a safe place. It just can't move it because it hasn't moved. 
And um, well, it was it's it's a it's not a nice story, but it's not a bad story, because actually the the young lady. That's why we didn't prosecute her. She wasn't shooting at me. She was going to shoot herself. And when a person's a little off at the time, and they're kind of strong, I grabbed the pistol, but I'm the one that got shot. People have described your singing voice and style almost to be operatic. Did you ever have any formal training in this area? Well, I can give credit to Mr. Billy Ward for that. He was a vocal coach at Carnegie Hall, and I studied under him for about, well, for two years straight. Why was it or how was it that uh, you never recorded for Barry Gordy and Motown? Was there a reason for that? Well, I was recording before he got Motown, and I was, I was with Brunswick, and we had no complaints. What makes Jackie Wilson still go? What makes you want to keep performing the way you do? Well, actually, no, there's somewhere I want to go. I just don't know where. I want to act, but not necessarily. I also want to, um, I want to be a disc jockey secretly. That's true. And uh, let me ask you this question yes. then. If you were a disc jockey for one hour and I put you in a studio to play records and uh, I said I'd give you a stack of one type of music or one type of performer you could play for an hour, what would that performer, who would you play for one solid hour if you were Elvis disc Presley. Jockey? Elvis Presley. Yes. That's interesting. Why, why would it be Elvis Presley? Because he's a very good friend of mine. I know a lot about him. I could talk a lot about him. In, in a, you know, I mean, in a very nice way. Right. He, um, well, he also did me a great favor once. I was in Hollywood, California, and I was playing a club called The Trip. And we were having a little difficulty getting people to come out, you know, at, at that particular time. So he came out twice for me. And, well, you couldn't get in. And they said, if Elvis go, then he must be, hey, let us go, man. When you're not performing, uh, are there any performers or special types of music you enjoy listening to? Yes. I like all types because actually if I'm, well, if I'm available, as you say, if I'm off work and I'm somewhere like uh, Vegas or I might be in like Tahoe, well, I'll go catch just about anybody. But I love Sammy Davis. I just love to watch him. And when Sinatra was around, I'd always get me a front row seat. I don't care where I was. If I was working, I'd have one night off. I'd go, you know, there. In fact, he'd done me a great favor once. I was playing Las Vegas. And I was at the Riviera in the lounge, and he was at the Sands. And we went down to see him one night on off night. And after he finished the show, and never forget, he had two big bands. I can't remember. He had Count Basie on one side of the stage, and he had, um, what was his other recording band that he did? Well, he's had Nelson Riddle. N Nelson Riddle on one side and Count Basie on the other. And there he was in the middle. And he'd do a number with Count, and he'd go over and do a number with Nelson. And after the show was over, he walked off and he applauded, and he, he came back out and he said, wait a minute, sit down. He said, what's the matter? He said, what's wrong with you? So I guess I'm going to tell you. It's a young man sitting in the front. His name is Jackie, Jackie Wilson. You go see him. I'm coming down. You'll dig him. And it was just great. <laughs> just like that, no more said, no more done. And walked off. And well, you couldn't get any place. They, they actually came down, everybody. In your career, you were singing rock and roll songs and you were traveling around the country on a lot of these tours and shows. But then in the 60s, you decided to make somewhat of a break and start appearing in major nightclubs like in New York, Las Vegas, Miami Beach. Right. Uh, was this transition from rock and roll package shows to nightclubs very difficult? No. <laughs> because I did the same act. <laughs> I never changed. <laughs> the only difference, I'd wear the tuxedos in the major clubs and in the rock and roll shows at... You know, I just wear the regular suits. How was it appearing at the Copa for the very first time, having a chance to go out on that floor where all the big stars were? I thought I was Sinatra Jr. <laughs> <laughs> no, I felt great, honestly. How, how did you ever get the name or the title that's been attached to you, Mr. Excitement? I, probably because I do perspire an awful lot. And uh, I, end up, I start the show the way most people finish, they tell me. One of the biggest songs, if not the biggest song, and the one that most people associate with Jackie Wilson was recorded in 1958 and wound up as being your biggest hit. I, I heard a story about the song, about the tempo which it was originally supposed to be recorded about. I'm, I'm speaking of the song Lonely Teardrops. You want to get the story no. behind that one? Right. Well, that's a, it's an it's a old story, but it's a good one. The truth of the matter, it was supposed to have been a ballad, a blues ballad. And it was written also by Barry Gordy, Jr. And uh, Nat and I flew in from New York 
we heard the song, we liked it, and we took it back. And then we did record it as a blues ballad, but we didn't like it. So then we decided to play with the guitar a little bit, and we had a great arranger at the time, Dick Jacobs. And we had him off a niggle with it a little bit, and we played, and we got a good tempo going, and it was like a chalypso at the time, which was very popular. And we took it, and we liked it, and we brought it back, and um, we gave it to the disc jockey. We ran, and it was hot off the press. We told him to play it. So they put the record on, and Barry was there, just waiting patiently, and everybody was just waiting, and they put it on. And Barry said, oh, my God, you ruined my record, my song. What have you done? Tears came out of his eyes. One person, uh, when I, when every time I listen to a song like Lonely Teardrops, uh, I, I think of a singing style, and this is why I want to get your opinion about this person, Sam Cooke. Oh, now you're talking about a man. That's a real stylist. Sam, to me, well, well actually, it's very well known that we were the best of friends. And, uh, in fact, we were the only two at the time that would go out on tour together and uh, we never worried about top billing we would just have me here one day and his name here the next day and you know this type of thing but as far as um singing and his style i well i just don't think it'll ever be equal was there something special that sam cook had that set him apart from other ordinary singers yes i just personally think it was god i think it's soul as, as they put it but to me it was god he had just a certain sound how do you describe what's happening in music today? Is there any special way you can describe it? Well, yes. As an intermingle of feelings between uh, different type people. Uh, you take your folk music. It's so groovy. And it's, it's actually different. And you take the Beatles when they came over with their sound. And you just take it and you mix it all up and you get what, you get one big, well, one big collaboration of of beautiful things and they do come out different very differently than uh well the 50s we had one main thing going we had a lot of knockdown drag out and then we had a little pretty music in between too but not just with the plain guitar and not with the makeup lyrics and in the makeup studio no more lead sheets who who needs them we go in you know and you just cut and it's just well i dig it you know Jackie, isn't it another thing, being a performer and, and having a chance, you feel that one great thing I've always felt about music is it can communicate to all kinds of people. It has no color line. It, it is so great that music sometimes can reach people more so than all the talking, all the politicians, or anything else. You can reach people, I mean, all kinds of people. Well, that's true, because of that I have noticed in my working that I find certain people, they won't clap for certain songs but they will clap for what they came to hear and that's a variety of things some people want to cry some come to laugh some come to knock down drag out some come and just plain listen study and then there's some that just come because they really enjoy watching their favorite their favorite performer and it's a beautiful feeling and a beautiful sight to see You know, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be back, like I said. And God knows I hope to be back in the near future very soon. Thank you very much. In the, me in the meanwhile, may I say, whatever goes up has a tendency most time to come down. Now, we all know that. We also know that what goes around eventually comes around but i'd like to say that nobody but nobody does anything wrong unless they want to do it by the same token no one does anything right unless they want to do it think about me and i'll be damned if I won't, think about you.